that have been praying to God, thanking him. Thank you for not making me more, man. Because, oh my God, that would suck. Women were made to desire their husbands and let them rule. Women were to trust God and wait for their perfect husband. <laughs> Men's voices were public while women's voices were private. When women did take charge, it was either sinful or because men had failed to do their jobs. I will make way more than he will ever make. Mm -hmm. She's the provider. Yes. A woman's position was supportive and secondary unless she had to temporarily step into leadership when men could not. Complementarian theology, male headship, biblical womanhood, all of that is wrong. This was my understanding of biblical womanhood. Elizabeth Elliot famously wrote that femininity receives. Women surrender, help, and respond while husbands provide, protect, and initiate. A biblical woman is a submissive woman. Hey bestie, welcome to the Spoiled Girly Support Group podcast where we talk about how to get that bag while also securing your own bag. I'm your host Elle and let's get into it. On today's episode, we are talking about the secret lives of Mormon wives and the eye-opening revelations that led women to exclaim, I'm glad I'm not Mormon. We are also getting into the rise of religious men because apparently men are increasingly entering religion as women are increasingly exiting religion. And this whole thing led me into the rabbit hole of figuring out why this is so. And one thing that I found is that it seems like many male-led religions such as Mormonism, Christianity, Islam, as practiced by people all over the world have this one feature in common. The supposed inferior position of women as submissive to men, specifically their husbands. So from that point of view, it kind of makes sense why more men are turning to religion because contemporary practices of religions give them power. And I'm so deep in this rabbit hole and I came across this book, The Making of Biblical Womanhood, which has a very optimistic view of the original teachings of the Bible. And when I read this book, let me tell you, my spoiled girly mind was blown. She was blown, shattered, and floating around in the galaxy. And I had to piece it all back together so I can make today's class. Now we have a lot to cover, but before we get into it, I need you to hit the like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you never miss a spoiled girly episode. With that being said, let's get into it. Ever since the Netflix reality tv show the secret lives of mormon wives came out we have been in our mormon discourse era and this video that i'm gonna play it captures how a lot of women feel about it watching secret lives of mormon wives has made me realize that you know what your life could be going so bad but at least you're not mormon just think about that and am i being mean i am okay if i was mormon i'm 21 I would probably have been married and had like a child or like multiple children at this point. And what a scary thought that is. Like the past four days, I've been praying to God, thanking him. Thank you for not making me more, man. Because, oh my God, that would suck. I mean, that's a take. And when you watch the show, it's kind of hard to disagree with her. The Secret Lives of Mormon Wives follows a group of young women, all mothers and some wives, as they navigate their faith, their careers, their identities and marriages and relationships and children and homemaking. Like, that's a lot of things to navigate and juggle and work on. And they're all in this group called Mom Talk and they're influencers and for the most part, they're the breadwinners for their families. And as we talked about in a past class, Mormons are born and bred to be influencers due to their high standards and expectations of beauty and because of their cultural practices of journaling and documenting their lives as well as their training in door-to-door -door sales. Like all of that apparently is what you need to be an influencer. I mean, I get it. And so a lot of your favorite influencers are Mormon, even though they're low-key about it because obviously faith is very personal. Like honestly, like 80% of my favorite influencers are Mormon. Like they're everywhere because of their training that they've been getting since they were young. Like it's just like they're born and bred to be influencers. So yeah, you'd be surprised how many of your favorite influencers are Mormon. And I guess one of the more satisfying aspects of watching this show is realizing that Mormons, they're just like us, okay? These women, they juggle their faith, their family, they're figuring out who they really are, especially at such a young age, like early 20s. You know, like they're questioning traditional gender roles. They're experiencing a lot of things for the first time. They're under this pressure to be the perfect wife while giving so much grace to their husbands who don't for one second question themselves if they're the perfect husbands. You know, like this show is really a look into how young women navigate 
navigate these systems built to profit off of their bodies and their literal labor. I mean, we're all living in the same system, but theirs is just a little more targeted, I guess, a little more intense, or maybe a lot more intense. And on top of that, on top of being mothers in their early years, getting married so early compared to everyone else around them, on top of all of that, the most shocking revelation is that the women, they're the breadwinners. They're the providers for their families. On top of being the primary caretakers and being the primary homemakers, like they're also cooking and cleaning and raising their children on top of providing. Like what are the men doing, okay? So it's just so interesting that they're the ones getting their bag. Speaking of getting their bag, let's talk about today's sponsor, Aura. Today's video is sponsored by Aura, and it's a timely moment to talk about them. Recently, there was a significant data breach involving national public data, a service used for background checks by employers and other organizations. In this breach, over 2.9 billion records were compromised, including names, addresses, dates of birth, phone numbers, and social security numbers. And unfortunately, some of this information has been made public online. If you haven't already taken steps to protect your personal information, this is an important reminder for the need for online security. With identity theft and data breaches becoming more frequent, it's important to stay vigilant. That's why I use Aura. Aura helps monitor your personal data, including your social security number, across billions of data points such as the dark web and public records to detect potential identity theft. In case of a breach, Aura offers up to $5 million in identity theft insurance for added peace of mind. Aura's all-in-one app also includes various other tools designed to keep your online presence secure. You can visit aura.com slash manifestl to try Aura for 14 days at no cost. In that time, Aura can scan and alert you if your personal data is at risk. I highly recommend taking advantage of today's offer, especially given the scale of today's breaches. To protect yourself and your family, visit aura.com slash manifest L and get started with your free 14 day trial. Now back to the topic. The lack of self-esteem from these truly stunning women mm -hmm. who pay for their homes. And I'm sorry, but it's like the lack of dignity and self-worth that I think that the community or the culture has bred into them. Yeah. Yeah. That she feels like even though she's working and providing for the family, she also needs to make sure she is placating her husband Husband's ego mm -hmm. so he always feels you know, like a man he feels like a man mm -hmm. and you know the fact that he will be a provider in a decade right. plus is their you know chief thing that needs to be discussed and given reverence to it's insane it's to insane. me what like makes me the most mad is just how flippant and disrespectful he is about mom talk as if it's just yes. so <gasps> stupid uh -huh. and not wildly impressive for a little background the scene that they're talking about is when jen's husband is talking about going to medical school in new york and jen brings up the career and the network that she has built in utah and keep in mind that jen is the sole provider for their family and when she brings up that they need to talk about the issue of moving away when the very enterprise feeding their family is based in utah he says i don't really care let's get into the comments him belittling mom talk as if it's not what they live off of is just huge levels of infuriating. Someone else said when he said that he doesn't care about mom talk but it literally funded his med school and his gambling habit. And someone said he hasn't even gone to med school he just graduated with his undergrad. I think we've talked about men going to become doctors in a different episode but like I mean anyone becoming a doctor is like this huge path and I know because I was on that path, but I just wasn't hardworking enough or smart enough to make it. But it's a lot, okay? You go through undergrad and some people, if your grades aren't high enough, you even do a post back, and then you get into medical school. If you even get into medical school and then you graduate medical school and then you go to residency, if you even get matched, because some people don't get matched. And then you either specialize after your residency, you could even do a fellowship after your residency. And like all throughout that time, you're either spending money for your education and you're not working. There's literally no time to work. And if you do get paid as an intern, as a resident, it's like below minimum wage. Okay, so Jen is gonna be the provider for their family up until he's in attending. It's tough. And I don't know if she knew that this was gonna be what's happening before they got married, even though Zach's family, they're all like surgeons and doctors. I don't know if she knew that she was marrying someone who's gonna be a doctor because in an interview, she says that, let me pull up the interview. In the interview, she says that the reason why she started being an influencer is because she had to provide. Listen to this. It was never my plan to do social 
social media. A couple years ago, I started up my videography business. It became a business naturally because my husband had committed to medical school at the time and I was forced to provide without a career background. I ended up posting my pregnancy journey and it blew up and got like 9 million views overnight. Okay, so to all the girlfriends, spouses, honestly, if you're a girlfriend of a medical student, this is what's in store for you. Okay, so all the girlfriends, spouses of these men who are medical students unless you are also a medical student like you get it but like if you're not this is what's in store for you so hopefully you're ready and then another thing that a lot of people have beef with with this situation is the chippendales scene where jen unknowingly goes to a chippendale show and let's break the fourth wall okay this is a job she's filming a show i'm pretty sure the producers wanted to be messy and take mormon girls to a chippendale show and if you're not familiar with the chippendale show it is a show where the men are very scantily clad and they are oiled up i think they're australian like they have accents and like you know they dance for you and sometimes they interact with the girls in the audience too so you know i know the producers wanted to be messy and do that so unknowingly these girls went to the chippendale show and zach who was there he wasn't even invited okay he wasn't invited to this girl's trip to vegas he was not invited he still goes because he wants to be with jen because the girls bring up that he is controlling okay so they're at the chippendale show and he calls jen or jen calls him or whatever and they have this phone call and Jen's crying and she's like I just wish you would see me as a human and I'm like what does he see you as is the dehumanization in this marriage like so big that she has to ask to be treated and seen as a human being like anyway and then he sends her these texts and here are the texts that really inspired today's class okay let's get into it are you curious what one of the many rage texts that Zach Affleck sent to Jen Affleck when the girls were in Vegas and Jen was surprised with that Chippendales excursion that she ended up going home very early from and not even remotely participating in? Well, don't worry. I at least can read one of them for you. I slowed it down, took a screenshot. Let's go ahead and just read it. Seriously, I don't want to hear one more time about your heart. Start taking accountability for your actions and the situations you put yourself in. Your Y-O-U-R, a grown woman. <laughs> yes, America, your future heart surgeon doesn't know the proper use of your and you are in a contraction. Doesn't matter your intention. You were there and this is the image you portray of yourself, family, church, etc. Everyone you represent with this platform. This next portion, find Katie asking Kyle that no, because she respect, again, the grammar. Now, because she respect her own values and her husband and would never put herself in that situation. The fact we are even having this conversation is sad, especially after everything with the temple. Okay, so basically he brings up the temple, right? Like that's very important. That's key to this whole class. He brings up the temple as a way to control Jen's behavior. Like think about what the people in the temple will think. And he also tries to turn her into a pick me by comparing her to another woman. Like, oh, this other woman doesn't behave like you do. She knows better than to go to Chippendale's show as a married Mormon woman. Like those two things, right? But I wanted to hone in on the use of the temple, the religion and the community, specifically the religious community to control control women's behavior but let's get back to the t because i want to be petty a lot of the commenters bring up how he's basically deflecting because he's gambling and losing 2500 dollars of jen's own money that she gave him because he has a gambling habit someone said he blew up over chippendales to minimize his gambling problem gaslighter and one thing i wanted to point out is how jen after filming after being surrounded by all the mormon girlies in mom talk who are rooting for her and advocating for her and validating her feelings her actions and raising her self-esteem she starts seeing the possibility of walking away if she is not treated well if she is not seen as a human being and she says since filming we've done therapy non-stop if we continue in our relationship there are changes that need to be made if they're not made we might have to look at other options but as of right now i do think he's trying his best to make those changes emphasis on the if we continue in our relationship and i love that she's bringing up how he has to make the changes which if you get the mormon vibe in this show is pretty groundbreaking she also said now that it's exposed we don't really have a choice but either to make those changes or walk away from the relationship it's hard for me to say that out loud and i feel like that 
if statement vibe wasn't there with her in the beginning like she was fully drinking the kool-aid on how she's wrong everything she's doing is wrong and everyone else validating that she's wrong and zach's right because uh, see there's like tea on tea on tea basically like zach's family the female members of his family they're all like putting out these articles and these facebook posts and just these comments about how it's hulu's fault for portraying Zach that way when Zach was portraying himself that way throughout the whole show like okay or it's Jen's fault for portraying their family in a bad light and come on he did that all by himself he could have been an amazing supportive husband who didn't even show up in the show like why can't like I don't think the husbands of the other girls were in the show at all or barely just in passing like why did Zach have to be there like full frontal okay why and why did his family also have to be in the show in like cameos and in scenes why like y'all could have just stayed in the background okay so this is like reality tv like expose like let's just be honest let's just be real okay like y'all wanted to be in the limelight and he could have portrayed himself in a better way he could have been supportive he could not have sent these just egregious texts to his wife when she's at a workplace like let's break the fourth wall okay she's working providing for their family because your son your brother your husband your cousin isn't the one providing for his family okay like give me a break jen also brings up how her mom is a cleaner in the same hospital that zach's dad is a surgeon to kind of like highlight the disparity between their socioeconomic statuses and why is the cleaning lady's daughter subsidizing the surgeon's son's life okay and jen just bringing that up i think it highlights too how she's made to confront that reality every damn day of her life because she's treated differently because of this disparity in how they were brought up which is very interesting like i don't know i just don't like the vibe coming from zach's family and how they're making jen feel bad for literally existing like why didn't zach marry another person from their same socioeconomic status like why not okay ticks me off and so this whole thing it just makes me so sad to think that if it wasn't for mom talk if it wasn't for these women like hyping jen up and if it wasn't for the show showing everyone what her husband is like and what the dysfunctional dynamic is like like she would still be going through life thinking she's the problem she would still be going through life thinking that leaving is not an option because from this interview it kind of shows me that now she knows that leaving is an option like now her husband has to make these changes if she's gonna stay because in the chip Dale show scene like he's literally threatening to divorce her and he's like putting her through this up and down emotional like roller coaster you know like she's at work and now she has to focus on if she's gonna get divorced tomorrow like why and I think he's playing with her like honestly it's as the commenter said gaslighter like no and this whole thing also gets me into the importance of girl friendships. Girl friendships, female friendships, like I know they're so difficult to start, to navigate, to keep all throughout these years. And in this show, it really shows you how girl friendship can be messy. But I swear, like if you surround yourself with kind-hearted women, like-minded women who want the best for you, like your life will absolutely change for the better. Like you will find the audacity that you never thought you have and you never thought that would be possible for you to have, okay? So cannot recommend girl friendships enough, obviously with the right women. Now, one thing that really pops out to me is how obviously this is reality TV is probably not even real despite the reality part of it. But Alyssa Grenfell, ex-Mormon TikToker, she says that unfortunately, unfortunately, the show is very accurate. So many people said that The Secret Lives of Mormon Wives would not be an accurate representation of Mormonism, but after binging the show, I could not disagree more. In my opinion, this show reveals the impact that Mormon doctrine has on the lives of real women to a T. So there you have it. Apparently, it's pretty accurate. To sum it all up, the show made a lot of women glad that they're not Mormon. And seeing how the Mormon women in the show were not only the breadwinners, the providers, they were also the primary caregivers and homemakers, all while 
while making their husband feel like a man, feel like a leader, feel like the head of household. No wonder men are turning to religion. In the New York Times article titled, In a First Among Christians, Young Men Are More Religious Than Young Women, Graham writes, Among Generation Z Christians, this dynamic is playing out in a stark way. The men are staying in church while the women are leaving at a remarkable clip. Church membership has been dropping in the United States for years, but within Gen Z, almost 40% of women now describe themselves as religiously unaffiliated, compared with 34% of men according to a survey last year of more than 5,000 Americans. In every other age group, men were more likely to be unaffiliated. That tracks with research that has shown that women have been consistently more religious than men, a finding so reliable that some scholars have characterized it as something like a universal human truth. Graham adds that young women, it seems, are moving past the debates and out the church doors. About two-thirds of women ages 18 to 29 say that most churches and religious congregations do not treat men and women equally, the Survey Center on American Life found. And here's a TikToker who expands more on that point. Okay, so I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Gen Z men aren't necessarily more religious than young women. They're just more likely to embrace a religion that says they are superior, smarter, stronger, and more important than their female counterparts. And I don't think that the Lord is sending these young men to the church. I think that these young men are flocking to an institution notorious for treating women poorly and not holding men accountable for their own actions. And I don't know why anyone is confused or surprised as to why young women might be leaving an institution that tells them their entire purpose is to serve and elevate the voices of men and have their children. And they need to cover their bodies because those men, they were made to serve their visual creatures who cannot control themselves. And so if they lust after her, it's her fault. And by the way, everything is her fault and has been since the very beginning of time, according to these ancient texts that were written by men, translated by men, and are interpreted by men. Those same men tell her that uh, when she gets married, she has to have unlimited on-demand and amazing with her husband and if he comes home with chlamydia it's her fault because she wasn't available enough for another woman tempted him or it was the devil so listen i think if churches want to see young women return they may want to rethink some of their beliefs and teachings and look it's easy to do because you all have been using these ancient texts for centuries to justify all kinds of things war slavery bigotry homophobia and on and on so take those ancient texts and find a way uh, to justify treating women well and i think that you're going to see uh, some results there Period. Okay, like if churches want women to go back to the church, they should really read the Bible, okay? Because today's class is all about reading the Bible as it's meant to be read as per historians and scholars. But before we get into that, let's get into these comments. Someone said, As a woman who is a pastor, 1010, no notes. I had an ex who said he chose Christianity because he knew he could be forgiven no matter what he did. I mean, I don't think it works if you don't really like truly authentically, genuinely repent. Someone else said, As a single woman in church ministry, I can confirm that lots of men show up and then leave once they realize we require commitment and integrity from our community. Someone else said, This is why my five sisters and I left our religion, but my brothers are devout. And someone commented on that. I mean, it's a pretty good deal for them. And someone else said, I went on a rant about this last night. The best part was where pastor bemoaned the lack of women because they do all the work at church functions. I mean, even outside of the home, women are still relied on for free labor. Fancy that. Now back to the article, Graham explains another layer as to why women are leaving the church. Arguments in other Christian institutions about women's roles have been raging for decades. Some churches have cracked down in recent years on practices like women speaking from the pulpit, the theology of complementarianism which asserts that men and women have some separate roles in marriage and church leadership is resurgent. Da, da, da. Young women are asking more questions than their forebears, said Beth Allison Barr, an historian at Baylor. Her book, The Making of Biblical Womanhood, How the Subjugation of Women Became Gospel Truth, was a surprise bestseller in 2021, sparking widespread conversations in conservative evangelical circles. The complementarian turn has really reduced the visibility of women in the church, Dr. Barr said. This generation is definitely more aware of that lack of women in leadership. And bestie believe I read the book. So let's get into the book that changed how I see religion. And I know we already did a God is a Woman class, and you may think that today's class contradicts that, but it doesn't. It's just an added layer onto that. With the rise of Gen Z men turning to religion, the girlies need to arm themselves with the knowledge to combat bad actors who will use the teachings of the Bible against them. So let's get into why complementarian theology, male headship, biblical womanhood, all of that is wrong. According to Dr. Beth Allison Barr, a Baylor historian who sounds like she still practices her Christian faith. Baylor writes, I 
knew that complementarian theology, biblical womanhood, was wrong. I knew that it was based on a handful of verses read apart from their historical context and used as a lens to interpret the rest of the Bible. The tail wags the dog, as Ben Witherington once commented, meaning that cultural assumptions and practices regarding womanhood are read into the biblical text rather than the biblical text being read within its own historical and cultural context. Da, da, da. As Christians, we are called to be different from the world, yet in our treatment of women, we often look just like everyone else. Ironically, complementarian theology claims it is defending a plain and natural interpretation of the Bible, while really defending an interpretation that has been corrupted by our sinful human drive to dominate others and build hierarchies of power and oppression. I can't think of anything less Christ-like than hierarchies like these. Period. And the vibe of the book is basically emphasizing that Christians are called to be different from the world by treating others better, by being equitable, by being brave, by promoting love as Jesus loves. Basically, the vibe is look around you and be better than that, okay? So when the world is patriarchal and hierarchical and oppressive, Christians shouldn't be like that. In a sense, the first Christians were revolutionaries, olden day activists. And when Barr says hierarchy, she's referring to patriarchy and she deconstructs that as well. So let's get into the beginning of patriarchy. Men lead, women follow, the Bible tells us so. One of the biggest, most mind-blowing ideas from this book is this question. What if patriarchy isn't divinely ordained, but is a result of human sin? When I read that line, I was like, wait, what if? What if patriarchy is born of sin, rooted in sin, and is therefore sin? Patriarchy is rooted in a man having dominion over other men. Slavery is wrong, just as patriarchy is wrong. And I get these questions about, obviously, we're matriarchy vibes over here. I always get this question, what about matriarchy? Isn't that women having power over men? No, it's not, okay? Matriarchy is collaborative, okay? It spreads out like this. Patriarchy is top-down hierarchy. Patriarchy is I'm here, you're here. Matriarchy is we're all in the same level, we're going to help each other. Like that's what matriarchy is. So tying it back to the Mormon wives show, Jen wanted to come to a mutual agreement with her husband about moving to New York or staying in Utah. She wanted to be on the same page as him. She just wanted to get a conversation going. But her husband, he says, I don't really care. Give up everything and move with me so I can go to school. And you're going to have to figure out how to provide for me after moving too, even though I just made you leave a career. Okay, that's patriarchy. So like in this little scene, it's like a microcosm of seeing how matriarchy and patriarchy work differently. And this idea was so enlightening to me because I never thought of it that way, that patriarchy is sin. It is born of sin, rooted in sin, and it is literally 100% sin. And it makes sense, and I've already told you this before, if you are even in a relationship or a situation where your church friends or your church community are policing you to stay in a situation where you're being disadvantaged, Managed, you need to leave because God loves you and he doesn't want that for you. Okay? Same with patriarchy. God loves us women. And if you believe he's a man, he wouldn't want this for us. She wouldn't want this for us. Okay? And yes, God was a woman and now God is a man. And at the end of the day, God still wouldn't want this for us. Okay? Barr writes, the biblical explanation for the birth of patriarchy, the first human sin built the first human power hierarchy. And apparently, among historians, everyone already knew that patriarchy was a result of the fall. And according to Barr, the patriarchy that continues to appear in biblical text is a mere accommodation to the reality of the times and culture. It is not a reflection of the divine ideal for humanity. Patriarchy is created by people, not ordained by God. Before the fall, both Adam and Eve submitted to God's authority. After the fall, because of sin, women would now turn first to their husbands, and their husbands, in the place of God, would rule over them. <laughs> That. Male authority over women contradicted God's will and perpetuated man's original rebellion against God. Women thus continued to commit the sin of Eve when they submitted to men rather than to God. Patriarchy was not just a result of the curse, it was embedded in the fall itself. Adam's rebellion was claiming God's authority for himself and Eve's rebellion was submitting to Adam in place of God. I'm sorry. Like, who's going to church on Sunday? Okay, that is wild. And the second equally mind-blowing idea I read from the book is how the Bible can be read two ways, descriptive of the times or prescriptive moving forward. So basically when there's these butt-ass backwards ideas, 
in the Bible or instructions in the Bible, for the most part, it's descriptive of the times. It is not prescriptive. Like when there's like these terrible things in the Bible, it's just describing it. It's not telling you that you should be terrible like that too, okay? It's literally telling us how terrible it was and we shouldn't be like these people. Barr writes, there's a difference between what is descriptive and what is prescriptive in the Bible. Echoes of human patriarchy parade throughout the New Testament from the exclusive leadership of male Jews to the harsh adultery laws applied to women and even to the right of Paul. The early church was trying to make sense of its place in a Greco-Roman world, and much of that world bled through into the church's stories. Dot, dot. That. Sarah Bessie, the progressive Christian writer, activist, and best-selling author of Jesus Feminist, is absolutely right that patriarchy is not God's dream for humanity. Doesn't the world of Galatians 3 seem more like the world of Jesus? Patriarchy may be a part of Christian history, but that doesn't make it Christian. It just shows us the historical and very human roots of biblical womanhood. One example of weaponizing the teachings of the Bible by completely misinterpreting it is using the teachings of Paul to justify excluding women from leadership in the church. Christians in the past may have used Paul to exclude women from leadership, but this doesn't mean that the subjugation of women is biblical. It just means that Christians today are repeating the same mistake of Christians in the past, modeling our treatment of women after the world around us instead of the world Jesus shows us is possible. Da, da, da. Instead of thinking along with Paul as Gaventa appeals, evangelicals have turned Paul into a weapon for our own culture wars. Paul shows us that gender discrimination is a return to the ways of the world, and we are called into the new world of the Christ crucified gospel. Instead of choosing the better part and embracing the new world of the Christ crucified gospel, we have chosen to keep doing what humans have always done, building our own tower of hierarchy and power. And even Pope John Paul II, the literal Pope, condemned weapon the teachings of Paul against women when he wrote in his 1988 apostolic letters that using Paul's writings in Ephesians 5 to justify male headship and female subordination in marriage would be the equivalent of using those passages to justify slavery. Another Pope John Paul slay. For context, let's read Ephesians 5, specifically verses 21 to 25. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church his body and is himself its savior now as the church submits to Christ so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her and okay that sounds kind of bad but listen to what Dr. Barr has to say about it instead of underscoring the inferiority of women Ephesians 5 underscores the equality of women they are called to submit in verse 22 just like their husbands are called to submit in verse 21 Instead of making Christians just another part of the Roman crowd emphasizing female submission, the mutual submission in verse 21 is characteristic of a way of life that sets believers apart from the non-believing world. Basically, we have to read it in context. If we were living in a hyper-patriarchal Roman world where women had absolutely no say in anything, telling men to submit to their wives as in verse 21 was revolutionary even heretical. No wonder the Romans unalived so many Christians back then, because it just undermines this whole Roman patriarchal system when you tell husbands to submit to their wives. And it makes so much more sense now. But here's the tea. Because of its radical implications, verse 21 must be distanced from verse 22 in Bible translations that wish to uphold complementarian views. So if you see here in the English Standard Version of the Bible, verse 21 is separated from verse 22. Like literally, it's a paragraph and then a title and then a paragraph. They separated 21 from 22 because they wanted to downplay this call for husbands to also submit to their wives. Barr writes, In this way, the ESV chooses to highlight female submission in verse 22, literally separating it from Paul's subversion of Roman patriarchy in verse 21. Long story short, they really formatted it weird to highlight women's subordination. So what I found refreshing in the book was the author's conviction in her faith that religion isn't the problem here. It's the teachings aren't the problem, it's the people interpreting it who's the problem. And that doing all of that, twisting the words of the Lord, all of that is the way of the world not the way of the Lord. Case in point, emphasizing women's submission to men, like male authority over women. And as we already quoted in the book, patriarchy was not just a result of the curse, it was embedded in the fall itself. Patriarchy was born of sin, rooted in sin, and it is literally sin. Adam's rebellion was claiming God's authority for himself, and Eve's rebellion 
was submitting to Adam in place of God, okay? So in short, all these men insisting on women's submission to them are committing sin. And if you submit to a man in place of God, then you are also committing sin, okay? Submission to men is the way of the world, the hierarchical patriarchal world, not the way of the Lord. So I'm actually not mad that Gen Z men are going to church in unprecedented numbers. Like, good for them and good for us. I hope they do internalize the teachings of the Bible. Maybe they'll be less violent as a demographic. We can only hope. And I know that a lot of the girlies think the Bible is problematic, Christianity is problematic, Mormonism is problematic, Islam is problematic. Like, tell me something I don't know. But what if they're the lesser evil? Okay, listen to this. From the New York Times article, Mr. Ferrier, 21 years old, said, says this about attending two services on most Sundays in Waco, Texas. Young men are attracted to harder truths. Sometimes, he added, he wants to hear messages with a little wrath of God in them. And this reminds me of a quote in Barbara Walker's The Crone. This God and other violent gods created by men demonstrate that the power of love cannot control men's lust to destroy their own species. It seems the only emotion that controls men effectively is fear. And it really explains why the definition of a good man is often a God fearing man and why a lot of women's dating preferences are non-negotiable is that a man needs to be a God fearing man because a man who fears God in their belief is a safe man and tell me why I was also brought up this way like if you're gonna find a man he needs to be God fearing he needs to believe in God like he needs to fear God he needs to have the fear of God in his bones like that's how I was brought up so at that point in my life and I'm looking for a man I'm like they need to believe in God he needs to be a godly man and this kind of just packages it all together. The reason why women are taught to find God-fearing men is because God-fearing men are supposedly safe because what else are men going to be controlled by if not fear? And it also explains why men control women and children with fear. Walker writes, ignored are the findings of modern psychology that fear is the basis of violence rather than its antagonist. Men control other men by fear. The ability to intimidate is their definition of power. Some men even try to control their own families by terrorizing wives and children. Instead of trying to understand how others feel and react, they become bullies by using methods they know would work on themselves. Such men feel contempt for creatures who cannot offer them any physical harm in retaliation, hence their contempt for women. So here's the question. Knowing that fear is what drives men's behavior, what if religions were built this way, like instilling fear because the religious leaders of the past, they have realized that the only way to control men's behavior, keep them from destroying their own species is fear. Okay, they realize that the only way to control men's behavior, curb their violence, keep them from plundering and doing things to people is to make them fear God via religion because without religion in those times and maybe in these times as well, women are much more at risk from men. And looking at it from that lens, it now also kind of makes sense why most of the apostles were men because they're the ones who needed guidance the most. They're the ones who needed to be taught love. They're the ones who needed to internalize the teachings of Jesus, okay? And Walker also points out the paradox of women creating a better world with men in it. The women's spirituality movement is faced with a paradox, how to control the morality of men who can only be controlled by fear while maintaining that rule by fear is evil. And Walker comes up with a brilliant solution. The basic fear of any young mammal is abandonment by the caretaking mother on whom it is totally dependent. She is everything necessary to life, warmth, nourishment, protection, tactile and kinesthetic stimulation, training in the skills of survival. To be rejected by her is to die. So men's primal subconscious fear is this fear of abandonment and rejection. So we don't need to threaten men or rule them by fear of bad things happening to them, of hurting them or whatever. Like we don't need to do that. We just need to leave. Leave the church if they're pulling you away from the teachings of Jesus as he intended. Leave the church if you're being pulled into the ways of the world. Leave the church if they're spreading hate and bigotry and the sin of patriarchy. Vote with your feet, like leave. And as a lot of women are increasingly finding out the church with all its fear based messages, the fear mongering, the policing of behavior 
it's not meant for women. It's meant for men. So let them flock to the church. Let them learn to love others as they love themselves, as God loves them. Let them find healthy brotherhood. Let them find a healthy sense of self. Let them find their purpose. Let them internalize the fear of God. So maybe they wouldn't have to face their primal fears of abandonment by the mother, the wife, the daughter, okay? And as for you and the women around you, arm yourself with the knowledge to combat whatever misinterpretations of the Bible, of the teachings of God, of the teachings of Christ, these heretical sinners who push patriarchy on you, which is a sin, so that you would submit to them, now you know, okay? Thank you for joining today's class. Remember, submission to a man is a way of the world, not the way of the Lord. And a true Christian man would know that. As Barr writes, evidence shows me that just because complementarianism uses biblical text doesn't mean it reflects biblical truth. Evidence shows me the trail of sin and destruction left in the wake of teachings that place women under the power of men. Evidence shows me throughout history that women who have always known the truth about patriarchy and who have always believed that Jesus sets women free. So let me give you my final pitch, because isn't it time for all of us to be free. Bestie, wake up. 